so as I say, the idea of automated reasoning as a concept goes back hundreds of years. But the practical use of automated reasoning um, more or less coincided with the first introduction of computers in the 1950s. In fact, some of the very early experiments with automated theorem proving were done by hand. People would actually execute algorithms by hand, like producing explicit algorithms, but then executing them by hand. I, I have an example in a moment. But of course, people were mostly interested in doing this on real computers, which were just then becoming available. And I think you can distinguish two general approaches. Uh, so some people had what you might call the artificial intelligence. So AI here means artificial intelligence. The sort of artificial intelligence approach where you try to understand how humans think and try to replicate that inside the computer. And so some of the early people in this area included um, Newell and Simon and Galantner. And then there were the more um, machine-oriented algorithmic approaches. Um, and this started with uh, several people also in the 50s, like Davis, Gilmore, Wang, and Prowitz. Um, and so if you look at the modern work, it seems the, this AI approach has pretty much died out. Not many people these days are pursuing this at all which maybe is a pity because maybe this is a sign that it's due for uh, a resurgence of interest. There's much more interest in using um, purely algorithmic approaches that just try to define some um, symbolic algorithms and efficiently apply them. Um, so here's a very early example of the AI approach. And this was an example that was actually done right at the dawn of the computing era by hand executing an algorithm. So it's a little bit of a cheat to say that this was done automatically. It was done algorithmically, let's say. Um, so it's a very simple geometry problem, the kind of thing you might see in a, a traditional Euclidean geometry thing. So you're given a triangle, and you are told that the triangle has isosceles, that is, that AB is equal to AC. So that's the hypothesis. And you are supposed to prove that this angle and this angle are equal. And so most, I think it's true to say most high school, at least in the USA, most high school geometry textbooks do something like this. They um, will drop a perpendicular first, and then they will use congruent triangle identities to kind of say that this triangle is congruent to that one, and therefore this angle is equal to that one. But when um, this uh, hand-executed geometry algorithm was run, it actually found a much simpler proof, um, which was actually already there in Pappus, namely that the triangle ABC is actually congruent to the triangle ACB. That's the kind of thing that human beings often overlook because they're not used to thinking of the same triangle as really two triangles with different orientation. But it's the kind of case where sometimes just naively executing a symbolic algorithm can give you some kind of insight that human beings can miss. But it did turn out that in the end that actually Pappus did find that back in the ancient Greek days, but it, it didn't make it into many geometry textbooks. Um, so that was a success for the AI approach back in the early days. Uh, more recently, there was a success for the, um, the algorithmic approach, which is connected with the Robbins conjecture. So the Robbins conjecture was about the axiomatization of Boolean algebras. Um, so you probably know roughly what a Boolean algebra is or a Boolean ring. You, know, you can just think of it as a, a ring that satisfies certain additional axioms. Um, and uh, back in 1933, um, Huntington um, produced the following slightly unintuitive axiomatization of Boolean algebras that basically you just need um, commutativity and associativity of addition. Together with this, uh, intuitively, if you think of um, you know, the usual sort of Boolean, Boolean algebra, you think of n as standing for negation. At least that's the intuition. Um, plus this somewhat unintuitive axiom about negation to replace all the usual simpler but uh, numerous axioms. So at that time, Rob, uh, Herbert Robbins conjectured that you could actually replace this axiom by this one, and you would get the same algebraic theory. 
In other words, those two sets of axioms had the same algebraic theory. Um, and this was actually an unproved conjecture for over 50 years. And it wasn't just uh, you know, idiots looking at it. There were some quite serious mathematicians who actually thought about this problem, including Tarski. Um, and so it beca because it's just equational reasoning, it became a popular uh, target for automated reasoning. And in 1996, um, Bill McCune's program, EQP, actually basically found a proof automatically, or to be strictly accurate, it found a proof of a lemma that was known to imply it. Um, and this was basically found by just running an equational logic proof search for slightly more than a week. Um, and it just churned away, deducing equational consequences, and it actually found um, a proof of this property. And this was uh, quite big news at the time. Uh, so it actually made the front page of the New York Times in 1996 that you know, a computer had beaten a human being. I guess it's a bit like when, uh, when Kasparov was beaten by the computer at chess. You know, it's a, it's a kind of uh, catches the public imagination a bit. So anyway, there, there are a few isolated successes. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that there's no hope whatsoever of ever doing anything interesting in a purely automated way. Um, Nevertheless, uh, we probably have to be somewhat realistic about the chances of you know, proving, say, the Poincaré conjecture by just uh, automated uh, reasoning alone. Um, so let's just remind ourselves in a bit more detail exactly what is decidable, and, or satisfi uh, uh, what is decidable about validity or satisfiability in certain logics. Well, propositional logic, is, uh, and by the way, don't worry if you don't know in detail what some of these things mean, because they will be more or less explained later. Um, so propositional logic, that's a classic decision pr uh, procedure set, and it's kind of obvious that it's decidable. Um, there are also many temporal logics that are useful in computer system verification, like, say, computational tree logic, CTL, or linear time uh, temporal logic, LTL where validity or satisfiability is decidable. Um, as I said earlier, first order logic validity is semi-decidable. That is, the set of um, provable formulas is a recursively enumerable set. So in principle, you can run a search procedure that will find proofs if they exist, but it may run forever if they don't. Um, however, if you look at higher order logic, that is basically logic where you have quantifiers over functions or quantifiers over predicates. Um, validity is not even semi-decidable. In fact, it's nowhere in the arithmetical hierarchy. So it's dramatically undecidable. And actually, um, this even applies to proofs in first order arithmetic with respect to the actual theory of natural numbers, for example, which I'll talk about later. So this gives us some rough idea about what we could hope to do in practice. Um, but it's important not to be too trammeled by these purely theoretical results because just because something is decidable in principle, it doesn't necessarily mean that the naive algorithms are useful. You, there may still be a lot of interest in trying to find efficient algorithms. And similarly, um, even undecidable problems, there may be a lot of very interesting decidable special cases, for example, uh, and those might cover the sort of things that people care about in practice. So we shouldn't be too either encouraged or discouraged by these theoretical limitations, but at least it's good to have some idea of, of what is possible and what's not possible. Um, and we're also often interested not just in validity with respect to every possible um, model of a formula, but we might only be interested in specific models or models satisfying some specific axioms. So in particular, it's very interesting to ask about whether um, the theories, by which I mean here the first order theories, of various um, kind of arithmetical theories are decidable. Um, so basically, linear arithmetic is decidable. Um, so, over the, uh, so, so over discrete structures, like the natural numbers or the integers, uh, linear arithmetic is decidable, but we know um, I guess Matiyasevich's theorem is the sharpest form of this, that nonlinear arithmetic is not even semi-decidable. Um, if you look at um, the real numbers, uh, the linear theory of real numbers is decidable. In, in fact, linear programming is basically this. Um, if you go to the nonlinear theory, it is still decidable, 
but the complexity is much, much worse. In fact, if I have time, I'll go through explicitly an algorithm for deciding that in the third lecture. Um, that's right, yeah. So it's basically doubly exponential in the number, even the, well, I think the best algorithms that are known theoretically are doubly exponential in the number of quantifier alternations. And I don't think even those have been implemented. Yeah, I believe that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for, the, um, for the complex numbers, again, both the linear and the nonlinear theories are decidable. And although there are some somewhat discouraging complexity bounds, this seems to be much more effective in practice. So there are a lot of algorithms like Grevner basis that can be used to get, in practice, quite efficient proofs in this area. And, and very often, some of these logical decision problems are just generalizations of known um, algorithms. So people have known about linear and integer programming um, even when they didn't think about them in explicitly logical terms using quantifiers. Um, similarly, there's, there are algorithms like Sturm's theorem that allow you to figure out how many roots a polynomial has in an interval. So in some sense, these positive decidability results can be seen as generalizations of these. OK, so that's enough background material. So now for the rest of this first lecture, I just want to talk about um, propositional logic. Uh, I, I don't exactly know about everybody's background here, but I'm assuming most people already uh, at least have some passing familiarity with what propositional logic is. But um, if only to fix the notation, let me summarize in this little table here. Um, so I'm going to be using um, these uh, notations here for logical formulas. So I'll use these quite a bit for examples. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with these symbols, it would be a good idea to try to uh, memorize them now. There, there are some other notations that are used. This is what Boole used in the old days. And here are some other common notations that you see. Um, so if, if you work in the hardware industry like me, um, it's very common to see the Boolean notation because most, uh, most uh, digital circuit designers actually still use the Boolean notation. So they tend to write it in this, this form. Um, so I'm going to use uh, this symbol for false, uh, this symbol for true, uh, this one for not P, this one for P and Q, this one for P or Q, uh, this one for P implies Q, and this one for P if and only if Q. OK, so yeah, I don't know. Is, is, I assume most people are already probably deeply familiar with the basics of uh, what propositional logic is. So uh, I assume I don't need to belabor this. Um, so you might say that propositional logic seems like a kind of boring subject to study. Um, and I think in the early days of uh, automated reasoning, it was actually ignored in a way which is kind of surprising. Um, I guess in those days, it was considered slightly boring because First, there are pretty severe limitations to what you can say with first order logic. Like if you don't have quantifiers or more interesting mathematical structures, the expressiveness is quite limited. And then there's the fact that it's, it's kind of obviously decidable. So from a theoretical point of view, that's not very interesting. Then I guess in the 1970s, um, people found another reason for being discouraged because basically propositional satisfiability was the original um, NP complete problem. Um, and therefore, this makes people think that it's probably um, intractable in practice. So whatever algorithms you produce, they're not going to be very efficient anyway. So what's the point? So uh, propositional logic was kind of stuck between these two um, contrary reasons for finding it uninteresting. One, that it's theoretically trivial, and one, that it's practically impossible. Um, and I think that was true for a long time. And so, it, so it, it was really ignored until the last couple of decades uh, in the automated reasoning community. Of course, people were investigating it a lot in, in uh, complexity theory and, and theories like that. But, but recently, this, is, this has changed. Um, so in the last decade or so, maybe two decades, there's really been a remarkable upsurge of interest in doing automated reasoning and propositional logic. So why, why should that be? Um, 
So first, people are starting to realize that you shouldn't dismiss too easily its expressivity um, because it can be used to encode quite a lot of interesting problems. In particular, you can certainly do a lot of uh, things connected with digital circuit design in propositional logic. Um, and even though um, SAT is NP complete and therefore you would expect every algorithm is impractical, people found that efficient algorithms actually can decide large, practically interesting problems, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Um, people, you know, routinely solve SAT instances with millions of logical connectives, which from a naive perspective, just thinking it's NP complete, so it's probably exponential, uh, you would think it's just ridiculous. But there's some kind of structure to real world problems that somehow means um, these theoretical limitations are not so interesting. In fact, the large number of applications it has almost turns the kind of NP complete um, objection on its head. Um, you know, in the old days, people would say, you know, it's an NP complete problem, therefore it's intractable. Um, and the reason it's intractable is, you know, there are all these reductions from other NP complete problems. Um, but you can look at that the other way too, since there are so many reductions from other combinatorial problems to propositional logic. Um, that means that if you do have a good algorithm for set, you could imagine actually genuinely using it to solve other combinatorial problems. You know, not just as a theoretical reduction that people do in complexity theory, but as a real practical way of solving problems. Uh, so, um, of course, uh, those people who've done any kind of digital circuit design are very familiar with propositional logic, which they usually call Boolean algebra. So there's a, a very direct relationship between, um, you know, concepts of logic and the kind of concepts that, you know, circuit designers at companies like Intel use every day. Um, you can think of a circuit as, you know, being representing a, a propositional formula, basically. And, you know, logic gates serve the function of propositional connectives. Um, atomic formulas are basically the inputs to a circuit. And internal wires you can think of as just sub-expressions inside a circuit, uh, inside a formula. Um, and, you know, a physical voltage level actually gives you, you know, a one or a zero, a true or a false, a notion of a truth value. So many, um, interesting problems in design and verification can be reduced either to a tautology or satisfiability checking. Um, and this is done all the time in the hardware industry. Um, for example, one very common situation is that uh, a circuit designer has designed some circuit and maybe they try to optimize it in some way to be more efficient or to use fewer gates or to have some better electrical characteristics. And so then you might just ask the simple question, is that optimization semantics preserving? Now, if you ask that question in a programming language, that's usually somewhat difficult to answer. But in this world where everything is a Boolean, you can basically just write that as a simple um, if and only if propositional formula and test for it using a SAT algorithm. And this is actually done, you know, uh, routinely now by circuit designers. So it's used uh, all the time. In fact, there are some very specific tools called um, FEV tools, formal equivalence verification, that are kind of specialized SAT solvers that are specifically designed to prove these kind of if and only if formulas. Um, because if you do the sort of straightforward SAT reduction on an if and only if formula, it isn't always optimal. There are some heuristics you can use to make it a bit more efficient, like exploiting common structure on the two sides and things like that. So that's one application of propositional logic in practice. Um, and, you know, because it's an NP-complete problem, we know in principle you can reduce a wide range of combinatorial problems to it. And there are some that people have actually tried um, using, um, in practice, Boolean satisfiability tools are with, for with some success. So, for example, um, you know, scheduling algorithms, um, and planning algorithms. These are the kind of algorithms that, you know, just do some kind of constraint solving. So, in fact, I, I did this myself once with some um, 
kind of instruction scheduling in a, um, in a program. Uh, for example, most microprocessors have um, several functional units and they have parallel functional units, but certain things take different numbers of cycles. So it's not always an easy combinatorial problem to figure out what's the best order to put independent instructions and exactly how to organize them to make the best use of machine uh, resources. Well, it turns out that it's not a bad idea to actually formulate this as a, a SAT problem and just use a satisfiability algorithm. You know, people have done specialized algorithms for these things, but sometimes, interestingly enough, it's actually more efficient to use SAT um, for some of these. You know, the, the more well-studied a particular combinatorial problem is, the less likely it is that just reducing to SAT is going to be better. But nevertheless, it can be surprisingly encouraging. And there are some somewhat surprising applications in mathematics too. So, um, for example, someone I, I encountered at a conference was doing something about, um, you know, whether certain abstract um, simplicial complexes can be embedded in Euclidean space and things like this. Um, so you can formulate all sorts of interesting problems this way. And even factorization of numbers, which is known to be a difficult problem. So you can express primality testing and factorization as a SAT problem. If you can't think of any smarter way to do it, then you can basically do whatever circuit designers do when they design multipliers and basically say, okay, here's a Boolean formula corresponding to a multiplier circuit. You know, is it possible that I can feed in two inputs A and B and get seven as the result. And you would hope the answer is no because seven is prime, but you hope if you ask, can I feed in some numbers and get six out, you would expect the answer to be true. And indeed, you know, this, this is, I don't expect you to understand this, but this is basically what that, what that is doing. And so you could feed in, um, so you could actually deduce from the satisfiability of this formula that, that six is not a prime number uh, and so on. I, I don't think that's actually competitive with real factorization methods, but it, it's interesting to see that you can do all sorts of things with, with SAT. So, okay, so since SAT is now quite interesting, um, what about the algorithms for solving it? Um, well, of course, the naive method is to do truth tables. So this is the way one normally uh, does things in most introductory logic texts. So if you have a propositional formula that has n propositional connectives, then you just consider all two to the n possible arrangements of true and false and figure out whether you get true or false at the output. But that, of course, is certainly not going to be practical. So that's clearly an exponential algorithm. Um, so if you have a lot of primitive, a, a lot of atomic formulas, that's not going to be practical. Um, so nowadays, people normally use, I would say, some variant of one of the following algorithms. Um, the first one is uh, binary decision diagrams, or BDDs. The other one is the, the Davis-Putnam algorithm, or strictly speaking, the DPLL algorithm, and it, its recent derivatives. And there's also um, Stolmark's method. This doesn't seem to be as widely used nowadays, perhaps partly because it's patented, but it's an interesting variant on um, the Davis-Putnam theme. So. Um, I'm going to launch into the details of the Davis-Putnam algorithm. Uh, I won't talk much about binary decision diagrams here, but that is one thing that you can find in my book. And those are particularly widely used in um, model checkers and various verification tools. Because binary decision diagrams are not just a way of testing satisfiability. They're actually an alternative representation of Boolean formulas as a kind of shared graph structure. And it turns out that a lot of operations on formulas become typically quite efficient in that um, situation. So BDDs um, have some um, specific applications of their own, but I, I won't talk about those in this lecture. Um, so I want to talk about the Davis-Putnam algorithm. So people normally refer to this as the Davis-Putnam algorithm, but the terminology is a little bit inaccurate because really there were two different algorithms. There was the original Davis-Putnam algorithm that was published in 1960, actually as part of a first order theorem proving algorithm. And that is nowadays basically not used. What people normally refer to as the Davis-Putnam algorithm is one that was published in 1968 um, by Davis, Loveland, and Logerman. 
So that has been uh, kind of called DPLL for Davis, Putnam, Loveland, Logerman. Um, so you can formulate this in several ways, but since the classic problem is set, um, let's present it as a test for satisfiability. So we have a propositional formula and we want to test if it's satisfiable. So there are three main components to the Davis-Putnam algorithm. Um, the first one is you um, transform the formula to conjunctive normal form. Um, and then the second one is you apply various simplification rules. And then the third one is um, you do some kind of case splitting. So I'll, I'll talk about those in turn. I should also say that even though people call these algorithms DPLL, the modern variants look quite a bit different from the original Davis Putnam, uh, the original DPLL algorithm. So I'll go through the original DPLL and then talk a, uh, briefly about how some of the modern implementations are different. So first, um, I wanted to talk about uh, normal form. So, uh, so the Davis-Putnam algorithm is using conjunctive normal form. Um, so there are several normal forms for logical expressions that are popular in automated theorem proving. Um, I should say that this is largely for classical logic. So um, these are much less applicable in intuitionistic logic where most of the connectives are independent of each other. Um, but in classical logic, um, it's very useful to use these kind of normal forms just so that you don't have as many primitive concepts to consider and things become more streamlined. So, um, so one way of reaching these normal forms is basically by a kind of algebraic normalization. So if you do it this way, it's very much like ordinary algebra. So if you think about, you know, if in high school you're given some algebraic expression and you're told to simplify it or, or something like that, or analyze it in some way, um, you know, very often you just do some kind of systematic normalizations, like, you know, maybe you, um, you know, you'll um, eliminate some defined concepts, like you'll convert negation into plus negative y, and then you'll, you know, eliminate double negations, you'll push negations through, you'll distribute multiplication over addition, and so on. Um, so one approach to these normal forms in logic uh, is to basically do exactly the same thing using Boolean manipulations. Uh, for example, um, you know, you could start with P implies Q, and you could transform it into not P or Q. And similarly, you can use the De Morgan laws to simplify not P and Q into not P or not Q. And you can use distributive properties of conjunction over disjunction. So P and Q or R, you can transform to P and Q or P and R, and so on. So if you take a formula and do the first two of these steps, that is, you eliminate every connective except for um, negation, disjunction and conjunction, and you push the negation as far down the formula as you can, that gives what is called negation normal form, NNF. So intuitively, it just means you eliminate all the kind of redundant connectives like if and only if, implication, and so on. Um, you express everything in terms of and, or, and not, and you push the nots down through the formula as far as you can. If you then um, use the distributive law um, to basically distribute the conjunction over the disjunction, um, then you basically get something that's analogous to a kind of sum of products in ordinary algebra. And that one is disjunctive normal form. Disjunctive in the sense you have disjunction, that is an or operation at, at the top. Um, and then conjunctive normal form is just the dual of that. So I guess this one doesn't have an analog in ordinary algebra because the, you don't have the sort of duality between and and or. But the distributive laws work just as well the other way around. So if you have P or Q and R, you can distribute that into P or Q and P or R and, and so on. So the first step of the Davis-Putnam algorithm is to reach this kind of conjunctive normal form. And most of the computations done on that conjunctive normal form. So, um, however, if you do that, um, 
it does have its drawback. If you just blindly use that algorithm that I just showed you, like algebraic simplifications, um, that may already cause the formula to grow exponentially in size. So that's kind of a bad start for any algorithm if the preprocessing step is already exponential. Um, for example, if you take this formula, um, you know, just if you have n ands or n ands and you naively distribute it, then you're going to basically get uh, you know, exponentially many terms, which is not, not good. So there is an alternative. Um, I think this actually goes back to Tsaitin, if I pronounce his name correctly, the Russian logician, um, which is often called um, the definitional approach to conjunctive normal form. Um, and the idea of this is that you introduce subformula, you introduce new variables corresponding to subformulas. For example, suppose you have this formula, P or Q and not R and S. So imagine that you introduce uh, a new variable, um, P1, which denotes the formula Q and not R. And then having done that, you introduce a new, for, a new variable, P2, to denote P, this formula and so on. Um, then the transformation of the formula is simply that you replace the formula by its eventual definition, P3, and you also produce if and only if um, formulas telling you basically how each of your new variables is defined. So intuitively, you can think of this as let P1 stand for this in, let P2 stand for this in, let P3 stand for this in, P3, and so on. Um, now, it's rather easy to see that this is not, in general, logically equivalent to the original formula, right, because you've introduced these new variables. Um, you know, it's trivial, even if this formula is a tautology, it's trivial to make this formula false by choosing um, this variable in the wrong way. Um, however, the key thing is that we're only testing for satisfiability, and this does preserve satisfiability, which is also very easy to see. So if the original formula is satisfiable, this is satisfiable and vice versa, which is the important thing. So it's safe to do this as a pre-processing step for a satisfiability testing algorithm. It's not preserving an if and only if relationship inside the logic, but it's, it's preserving satisfiability. So anyway, once you've done this, um, then you can um, transform it into a conjunctive normal form via the naive algorithm, basically. Um, and this also has another nice characteristic that when you've reduced the thing to conjunctive normal form, um, no, none of your conjuncts is going to have more than three items in the disjunction. Which, uh, that's a property that also doesn't hold of the naive algorithm. Um, because basically, they all result from just um, applying the CNF transformation to these very simple formulas. Um, and so that's of some theoretical interest because it kind of shows the, the universality of, of, of SAT for clauses of length three. Okay, so <clears throat> it's traditional in automated theorem proving to think of these disjunctions as sets. It's usually called clausal form. So the, I don't think it's true that people really observe the terminological distinction precisely. But roughly speaking, people talk about conjunctive normal form when you explicitly think about a formula involving, quanti involving connectives. And they talk about clausal forms when you just manipulate them as if they were sets. But implicitly, you think of the fact that there are logical connectives between them. So in, in, in other words, instead of thinking of, of this disjunctive thing as a formula, we just think about it as a set. And in that context, it's usually called a clause. And so the overall formula is then just a conjunction of these clauses. And we usually just think of that as a set too. So you kind of think of the whole thing in terms of implementation as just a set of sets. And implicitly, you understand that there are these um, logical connectives implicit. And you know because the AND and the OR operations are associative and commutative and idempotent, you don't lose anything in this representation. If anything, it's more efficient and more straightforward to implement things. Um, but we do need two special cases, of course, because you might want to talk about the specific formulas true and false. Um, but that's quite easy. Um, 
an empty clause we think of as just meaning false. Um, and the empty set of clauses you can think of as just meaning true. So that means that for satisfiability purposes, you can just think of your formula to be your clausal form of a formula as just a set of sets. And if the set of sets is empty, then it's just um, the formula true. And if your set contains a set that's empty, then that formula is, is false. So that's the usual setting for the Davis Putnam algorithm. You've taken the formula via some method, efficient or otherwise, you've reduced it to this clausal form. And then the manipulations take place on these sets of sets. So it's kind of simple algorithmically because you're just manipulating sets of sets, at least in principle. <coughs> So the Davis-Putnam algorithm, the original Davis-Putnam algorithm anyway, has two simplification rules, um, which you can think of as just two transformations on the set of clauses. So first, um, if you have a so-called unit clause, in other words, if any of your clauses is just a singleton set P, just meaning P is true, not P or something is true, just P itself is true, then you can remove not P from all the other clauses. That is somewhat obvious because if you're assuming that P is true, then anything else that says something or not P is equivalent to just something. And then of course, once you've made that transformation, you might as well also remove P um, because you've eliminated P from the other clauses. So that's the, in Davis's, in Davis Putnam's original paper, that was called the, the one literal rule. Nowadays, it's more usually called unit propagation. Um, but this is the core, if you like, the core uh, inference rule in the procedure. Davis's, Davis and Putnam's original paper also had this so-called affirmative negative rule. In fact, this rule has kind of been forgotten about a bit recently, so a lot of the uh, more modern implementations don't even bother with this rule. Um, but it's anyway, it's a somewhat interesting one. So it says, if P occurs only negated or only unnegated, then you might as well uh, remove all the clauses that contain P. The intuition for that is that if P only occurs unnegated, then you can always satisfy that formula by just setting it to true, so it's, it's not that interesting, and vice versa. So these two transformations both preserve satisfiability of clause sets. So if you, uh, if you start with a clause set and you apply either of these rules, um, you get an equisatisfiable set. So you're not gaining or losing anything by these transformations, except you may be simplifying things. But lo logically, I mean, you're not changing anything. But, um, but in general, just applying these simplification rules isn't going to allow you to decide satisfiability. So the next thing you need to do is perform some kind of case splits. So the idea of the case split is, if you've got some set of clauses delta, um, Basically, you just choose some new variable P, and you do a case split according to whether P is true or false. So you take your starting clause set delta, and you take the augmented uh, clause set um, delta together with not P. Um, you apply whatever simplifications you can, and you get some new set of clauses. On the other hand, if you assume that P is true, you'll get some other set of clauses. Now, you may now be lucky, and the simplification rules will collapse enough to reduce everything to true or to false. Um, but if that's not the case, then in general, you need, to, you need to nest these case splits. So in practice, you would get some kind of, um, at least conceptually, something you think of as a kind of decision tree. So first, you, uh, you test if P is true. And then having done that, you test if Q is true, and then you test if R is true, and so on, until at some point uh, you simplify sufficiently. Uh, so in general, you do need nesting of these case splits. Um, and it's also relatively easy to see that this algorithm will eventually terminate. Um, first of all, um, applying the simplification rules obviously terminates because you're either reducing the number of clauses or reducing the number of variables in the clause. Um, and also, um, every time you do a case split, um, then uh, 
even though that's temporarily increasing the complexity of the clause set, the unit propagation rule is immediately going to eliminate P from all the other clauses. So again, you're reducing the number of propositional variables. So each time you do a case split, you're basically reducing the number of variables effectively. So it's, it's clear for that reason that this process in principle must terminate. And so either um, for some branch of the tree, you'll, um, you'll run out of clauses and get the empty set of clauses, in which case you'll deduce the formula is satisfiable. Otherwise, for every nested set of case splits you explore, um, you, won't, you won't get a refutation, and then you'll conclude that the formula is unsatisfiable. And if you decide that, the, and if you get a satisfiable formula, you just need to follow through the sequence of case splits that you did to, to reach that, um, the case where the thing collapsed to the empty set of clauses, and that gives you your satisfying assignment. So it's, it's concrete, you get an actual um, satisfying assignment. Um, so that's what you might call the, um, the traditional uh, DPLL algorithm. Now, I guess over the last, what, 20 years, there's been a lot of uh, quite dramatic performance improvements in SAT algorithms. And they've made quite a large number of improvements to the basic DPLL algorithm. So in fact, uh, if you look at an implementation of a modern DPLL solver, it doesn't look, at least at first glance, very much like the classic DPLL. Um, so one, uh, perhaps the most fundamental improvement is this so-called um, non-chronological back-jumping um, learning conflict clauses, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, but there's also just been a lot of attention to the details of the implementation. Um, so in particular, the, the unit propagation step, where if you have a unit clause P, you, did, you propagate that information to the other clauses, is kind of a bottleneck in any implementation. So there's been a lot of attention to just making that rule as efficient as possible. Um, and so th there's, uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, you know, our clever heuristics and tricks, like the so-called watched literal technique, which will allow you to, um, to do that effectively. Um, and of course, I didn't say anything about how you choose the variable to case split on. In general, it can make a big difference if you choose a good variable at the beginning. Um, so there are some heuristics usually based on something about the problem structure for picking which uh, variable to split over. And sometimes um, these algorithms will even restart. So if they're doing a sequence of case splits and not making enough progress, they'll basically give up completely and restart with a different series of case splits. Um, and then of course there's just a lot of um, attention to, to highly efficient data structures. So I think this, this really started with Chaff where they were even considering things like you know, the cache behavior of the program, the kind of thing a lot of high level symbolic computation people just don't think about. And little things like that can make a huge difference. Um, so there are a whole bunch of, of, of set solvers around like you know, Chaff, Minisat, PicoSat, the, the list is endless. Um, which are surprisingly efficient. Um, so as I said, the, in some sense, the most fundamental, I would say the most fundamental improvement is this, this non-chronological back jumping. Um, so if you think about how I presented the original case splitting algorithm, you would basically be exploring a tree of possibilities in a kind of depth first fashion. So, you know, first set P equal to true, then set Q equal to true, and then explore that, and then that, and then that. And so you're basically exploring this tree in a kind of depth first fashion. Um, the idea of non-chronological back jumping is that in some situations you can uh, shortcut that kind of um, case splitting. So suppose, for example, that you have these two clauses so not P1, da, 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 not P10, not P11, and you have another one that's not P1, da, 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 and it's exactly the same up to, say, not P11. Now, if you choose to case split according to the order P1, P2, and so on, up to P10, um, then eventually you are going to get a conflict. Um, but really, in those conflicts, um, the most relevant part is really just the last few variables. 
So for example, if you've gone down the branch where all of these things are true, um, then you are going to uh, then do a case split on P11, and that'll give you some uh, further information. But actually, it's only um, P10 that's relevant to that decision, right? So you could have, um, none of the assignments to the other variables are relevant because it's only um, P11 and not P11 that you're getting new information from. So when you've actually got down to the stage of getting a conflict, you could say, okay, so the reason that the conflict arose is basically because of P11. So I will um, backtrack over all the decisions of P1 up to P9 and just start my other explorations from going the other way with, uh, sorry, with P10, because that's the one before P11. Uh, so I can just, um, in, instead of laboriously exploring all of this tree, I can jump all the way back to the top of the decision tree and next time explore um, flipping P10 the other way. And there are several different ways algorithmically that you can do this, but one of the interesting ones is to actually add these so-called conflict clauses because once you've got this conflict, the conflict itself allows you to deduce that um, that uh, this um, actually holds and so you can sort of grow your set of clauses. This is something that didn't happen in the original DPLL algorithm. You'd actually always simplify your set of clauses and reduce it. The new algorithms actually add these so-called, or most of them actually add these new so-called conflict clauses. So at least conceptually, you're actually growing the set of clauses during the algorithm. Um, and experience indicates that this can be quite effective. So the use of these techniques, I think, has really led to a lot of the performance improvements. But there's another interesting approach, which is really completely different. Um, and that's used in Stolmark's algorithm. Um, and the way Stolmark's algorithm works is it still does, it, it's traditionally presented in a somewhat different way from DPLL, but you could think of it as a variant of DPLL, where you use it on a formula in clausal form. The key idea of Stolmark's algorithm is, so you do exactly the same case split. You start with delta and you get um, delta or not P, and delta or P, and then you apply some other simplification rules. So far, just like in the Davis-Putnam procedure where you'd apply the one literal rule here. Um, but then what Stolmark's algorithm is, says is the following. So look at the new set of clauses that you get. So as a result of assuming not P, you've deduced some new clauses, um, delta zero, and as a result of apply, sorry, as a result of a, assuming not P, you deduced some new clauses delta zero, and as a result of assuming P, you deduced some new clauses delta one. So what if there are actually things that are common to both delta zero and delta one? Well, we know they must just follow directly from delta because um, you can deduce them from not P and you can deduce them from P. Therefore, you must just that is delta together with P and not P. Therefore, you must just be able to deduce them from delta. So it's legitimate to actually rejoin this case split and get the new set of formulas, um, your original set of formulas, together with the common things that arose from the two case splits. So this is somewhat analogous to the idea of uh, learning conflict clauses, but it's done in a different kind of way. So if you imagine how um, the Davis-Putnam algorithm, at least in its original formulation, works, you you get a kind of, um, you get some sort of exploration like this, where you, um, you know, keep exploring branches, you know, sometimes to considerable depth. Whereas in Stolmark's algorithm, um, you might actually even get a situation where you never need to do two simultaneous case splits. You might, you just have a sequence of these kind of diamonds and each time you go down through one of these diamonds, you get a little bit more information. And so it may be that without even ever doing two nested case splits, you may be able to make progress. So Stolmark actually classifies formulas according to how many simultaneous case splits you need. So he, 
refers to formulas that can be proved by just one case split at a time as, as being one easy. And those that need at most two are too easy and so on. And surprisingly, Stolmark discovered that a lot of formulas that arise in practical applications actually fall into one of these very low levels of the hierarchy. It is fairly easy theoretically to come up with examples that, are, you know, that do require a lot of nested case splits, but they seem to be quite rare in practice. So that's another uh, very interesting algorithm. It's not getting as much attention as some of the other algorithms. I think perhaps partly because DPLL um, has just improved so much over recent decades. And also, Stolmark actually patented this algorithm. So for a long time, his company was uh, basically selling the rights to use this algorithm for commercial use. Um, so, I sh so I should say, if you use the implementation of Stolmark's algorithm in my code, you're not allowed to use it for commercial purposes. So that's the legal disclaimer. <clears throat> Not that I think anyone would be crazy enough to do that with this, uh, this inefficient model implementation. But anyway. But you can't do it, uh, this easily in parallel. That's true. That's true. There is a, yeah, that's right. It has a kind of serial structure. That's another, another factor. That may also be a, a factor why people might prefer DPLL. Yeah. OK, so that's the end of my first uh, group of material. So I guess. Uh, that might be a good moment for a short break. <coughs> uh, and also, if people have any questions, um, you know, feel free to ask. And then um, I'll go on with the next uh, material in, what, 